Five. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the Shift the Power series from the Center for Strategic Philanthropy at the University of Cambridge's Judge Business School. Really delighted to have you all join us today. I know there's been a lot of excitement around this topic in the run up to the event. So uh, really excited to hear from our speakers and to get stuck in. But before we do that, I'm just going to give a couple of minutes to make sure that everybody has managed to sign in. I know we have up to some, almost getting up to 200 people dialing in today, which is great. Uh, the audience are as important as our speakers. So we will be coming to you, our audience, for insights and for questions later on. So my name is Claire Woodcraft. I'm the executive director of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy. Our center, as you can see, is based inside the University of Cambridge. And our focus is on emerging markets and particularly the Middle East, Africa and Southeast Asia. We are engaged in three areas of activity. We run executive education programs for Global South practitioners, trying to support their work in increasing impact in philanthropy. We have a research portfolio also looking at philanthropy in emerging markets and how we can improve impact. And we engage in events like this, thought leadership, really trying to build a community of professionals and people who are working in or with a Global South practitioners, particularly in those markets, Middle East, Africa and Southeast Asia. So today's topic is make it flexible, building resilience. And the choice of topic is really a product of our own research, that of others, and of course, the shift the power movement that is really gaining traction at the moment. So throughout our work, our current research portfolio, and even historically in our respective practitioner roles, we have identified challenges around how philanthropic capital is often dispersed in a manner that doesn't allow for maximum flexibility when it's deployed. Issues such as restricted funding and complex grant application processes are nothing new. We've been talking about them for, for many decades. But what we'd really like to look at today is how we can, and especially as COVID has catalyzed change in the sector, how we can get more flexible, best practice out of the sector, particularly for global South markets, particularly at a time of COVID, when of course resilience is so critical. So we're gonna to come to our topic shortly, just a couple of points on housekeeping. So we do have a Q and A, and we would ask you please to submit your questions to the Q and A box. You can also chat in the chat, but so that I can uh, address your questions, um, I will be looking at the Q and A box after our speakers have finished discussing. We will uh, have an upvote capacity in the Q&A box, so our Q&A is democratic, so the questions that get the most uh, votes will be the ones that will come in prioritize for being asked to the speakers. Um, our session will end at 15.30, at 3.30 British summer time. If you need to jump off before, don't worry, we do have the whole session recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel, where you can also see the earlier sessions of our Shift the Power series. And we would encourage you to sign up to our social media accounts. And even if you're um, live tweeting the event, please hashtag us in at, at Cambridge CSP uh, on Twitter. So today, now to our speakers, I'm absolutely delighted and inspired because I've already had uh, various conversations with our speakers uh, to have with me today. First of all, Mukhtar Koashi from the Civil Society and, and he's a philanthropist uh, consultant and advisor working very closely with the Rawa Creative Palestinian Communities Fund. And we'll hear from, more from Mukhtar's experience uh, shortly, but someone with deep and rich expertise in this area around power dynamics, but also of course in, in emerging markets. Secondly, we have Chilande Koloba Waria, who is the founder and managing director of the Warande, Warande Advisory Center. So she also has amazing expertise and thoughts and ideas that she's bringing with us today on this topic. Uh, and another well-known practitioner expert in the sector is Kennedy Odede, who joins us. He's the president and CEO of the Shining Hope for Communities organization, otherwise known as Shofco. So really delighted to have all three of you with, you, with us today and thank you so much for your time. Unfortunately, my, uh, my co-host Kamel Munir is not able to join me today, but he will be with us uh, next for the next series, number four in the Shift the Power series. 
And we are waiting and we hope very much that Selina Sambang, the CEO of Save the Children Indonesia will be able to join us today. She's currently having some connectivity issues. Uh, she's based in Indonesia, trying to dial in. So hopefully she'll join us partway through the conversation. Uh, and I think um, we all have a lot of uh, empathy for her, given that connectivity seems to be a, a global challenge in these difficult times. So the background to the series, why did we start this? So we undertook a research last year looking at the impact of COVID-19 on emerging markets and tried to identify some of the trends, some of the challenges. And one of the key issues that, were, that arose was something that we're all familiar with, the idea of power dynamics, power dynamics in the sector and how power dynamics dictates best practice in the sector. And of course, the predominance of Global North foundations and philanthropists in crafting how philanthropy is distributed in the Global South. And through the course of our work, we called for change, it called for advocacy in that space. And we also identified multiple other organizations that were working in the same area, really looking at power dynamics in philanthropy and how the imbalance in power dynamics can potentially offset impact in emerging markets. We also connected with those who were involved in creating what is now a dedicated website. So organizations such as GCFC in, in South Africa, uh, CAPC, our, our research partners in, in South Africa, and even uh, the organizations uh, that are represented by our speakers here today, all really looking collectively at how we can shift the power dynamic in the philanthropic sector, particularly for emerging markets. And we believe there is a momentum in this space. You will probably have seen via social media that there are multiple events now happening under this rubric. And we think that's a good thing. We would like to encourage the creation of a movement, the movement that actually leads to advocacy and obviously a real change in the way that some of these issues are being addressed. As I say, none of them are particularly new when we talk about lifting restrictions on philanthropic capital, it's something that has been discussed for at least 10 years. And yet still we are seeing that the vast majority of philanthropic capital coming into the Global South still has some form of restrictions. So on that note, just before we go straight to our speakers, I'm going to pull up a poll so we can test our audience's thinking on this topic. So if we can have poll number one from my colleague, Jack, thank you very much for that, Jack. We wanna ask you, so how prominent is the issue of funding resilience, the idea that we need to change the way we allocate philanthropic capital in order to promote resilience, look, looking beyond impact. Is it very prominent? Is it somewhat prominent? Unsure, not very prominent, or it's not an issue? It's a word that we're hearing used a lot these days, the idea of resilience. And we're keen to see what others are thinking and how they're identifying this. And we will come to that in our discussions. But I see from our poll results that yes, 68, 60, at least a, High, high percentage of you believe that it is very prominent and actually nobody at this stage has said that it's not an issue. So that's great. We have justification for our discussions today. The second poll I'd like to ask you is more specific. Um, and this relates to some of our partners that we have been working with and specifically the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. Obviously they've been particularly active during COVID and done some significant research in this space. So they had a report that quantified the percentage of funding dispersed in the middle of the crisis that was unrestricted. And I want to ask you what you think that percentage might have been. So how much funding in the middle of COVID was unrestricted in your opinion? See the numbers coming up now and yes, uh, well, well done. It seems like you all read the report. <laughs> So it is in fact 21%, so a mere 21%. So despite all the discussions during COVID of the need for resilient, unrestricted, flexible interventions, the reality was that only around 20% was actually restricted on the back of the crisis. So clearly still a long way to go. So thanks for the polls, Jack. Let's move now to our speakers and kick off our discussions today. So we have had various, uh, engagement with our three speakers here today, and they've already uh, given us some brilliant and rich insights into this topic. Resilience is something that I think historically we tended to define as kind of the practicality of being able to bounce back after a crisis. And indeed, that's some of the definitions that have come out of the UN 
Um, the IPCC talks about it being the capacity of a system to reorganize. But that was before COVID. If we look at COVID now, increasingly what we're seeing is that resilience is being defined as radical change, really looking at system change and structural, structural reform around the way we deploy philanthropic capital in order to ensure that institutions and communities can cope with future socioeconomic challenges. So I want to kick off today with Mukhtar. So Mukhtar, we had a very interesting conversation with you in the preparation for this event. And we talked, I feel like we're moving now beyond, especially after our conversations with you and the other speakers, that, that our goal at the outset of this event was to really look at some of the, I guess, the practicality of unconditional and, and unrestricted funding. And I think that in talking to you and your peers, we've actually realized that this is a much bigger, deeper philosophical question that obviously whether tactically one gives restricted funding or unrestricted funding is not a technical issue. It's an issue around power, around where money is coming from and who's taking the decisions. So talk to us a little bit. You work extensively both with Global North Foundations um, with, uh, and with local communities. So I think you're obviously coming at it from both sides. You've seen both sides of the coin. Talk to us a little bit about what you think resilience represents, what it means, and what are the structural reasons around behind how we can support and, and grow it? Thank you, uh, uh, Claire, and, uh, uh, and uh, I'm glad to be with uh, our speakers today and to be digging into this topic. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I um, you know, we, for some of us, have been in, in, in meetings and in, uh, in these conversations for decades, and the same issues keep, keep coming back uh, uh, over and over again. And, um, and there must be, um, you know, uh, in my opinion, uh, a fundamental problem in the ecology in which these conversations are taking place. Because the field of philanthropy and development, as they're kind of both related, especially since we're all working in the global south, um, is filled with very, very smart and capable people. And the nature of the issues that we spend time um, working on or trying to change are very technical and um, they're really uh, pedantic. So that they're, 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 they're problems that we can find solutions for. In fact, we have had solutions. Communities all over Global South have had solutions. And smart people within philanthropy have solutions for some of our, um, 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 you know, sort of... Uh, uh, a technical, uh, uh, process-oriented, uh, legal-oriented, fiduciary-oriented issues. But I feel that, again, the word um, resilience has been um, uh, overused um, uh, in so many ways. And it seems like it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's yet another rubric for, um, um, for allowing kind of a, 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 a defining a space of um, uh, 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 to allow um, uh, com communities and uh, 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 the global south to kind of um, carve out a space of experimentation and then uh, redefine things in terms of resilience. Well, you know, I think it's we've shown it's been very clear that the global south communities are extremely resilient and capable, um, but the fundamental issues and that form the architecture and the nature of our relationships um, in, within philanthropy, as well as in development, are actually political in uh, nature. They are not technical. They are not uh, uh, issues that of, uh, of uh, administrative uh, nature. Um, I think that um, you know, we are reaching a critical moment within philanthropy and development aid um, where uh, there is increased doubt by emerging leaders um, about the integrity, but also the, um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the seriousness of, of our sector. Um, it seems that, uh, it seems clear to most that the issues are primarily issues of justice um, and equity, um, rather than issues of um, uh, charity. And, and how we form that. Uh, just to give you a, a, a quick sense of, of capital flow uh, 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 today, um, for every dollar that uh, is spent 
in, by the North to the global South. There are about $3 that are sent back up to the global North from the global South. So it's not the global North that is supporting the global South. It's actually the other way around and has been for decades. And so if we just dissociate, and I'll, and I'll close, if we dissociate um, and, and, and act in an amnesiac manner, uh, uh, issues of politics and access and, um, and uh, power dynamics as they are, uh, um, um, have been historically um, uh, related to issues of philanthropy, to the community of philanthropy, whether we're talking about colonial times or slavery or today in terms of how capital is controlled by neoliberal corporations, um, then we are not ever going to get to a place where we can really create systems that are uh, uh, that make an impact, sustained impact, but we're going to continue to have this kind of masquerade of um, support um, and a dance where people in the global south who are recipients, which is a terrible <laughs> word, um, uh, will need to kind of jump through hoops and then change their song and dance, uh, you know, as, as many of us do in order to have access to momentary resources. So I feel that the sector is at a critical juncture. Um, it would be, a, or we, the development aid world is already in, in, in crisis because of critical debates that question the legitimacy of that of their processes. And I feel that philanthropy is at the, exactly the same place. We run the risk of being devalued, losing uh, the possibility of attracting um, uh, uh, a critical minds to the sector, because fundamentally, if we don't put, if we don't ask ourselves, where does the money come from? Who holds it? How is it dispersed? And what, where, what is the kind of global political framework in which those transactions happen, which at the end of the day are related to issues of justice and not issues of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of char charity. And just to close, you know, an example, on, to take an example on, on the issue of Palestine, over the last two decades, uh, Palestinians at various times have received some of the largest uh, per capita aid um, on the planet, yet their political self-determination has literally slid down as that aid has increased and they've lost complete space for autonomy and colonization has continued to, to, to happen. And so in a sense, the aid and the philanthropic sector have participated and enabled the, the status quo uh, that, has, uh, uh, that has dominated their lives rather than create a systems change, which is a question of ethics, mor morals, and uh, uh, justice rather than issues of transactions and, and, uh, and, and charity. So the, the French expression plus ça change comes to mind, Mukhtar. I mean, you're talking about the journey of aid and I remember very clearly in the 90s, we were talking about aid effectiveness and then that discussion seemed to evolve into philanthropic effectiveness. And it seems like we just, uh, we're not learning from the past. We're not learning that those structural um, issues still remain. And I, I want to ask you later when we come back to you to talk a little bit about Ford Foundation because they were one of the exceptions during COVID that Ford Foundation and many people say it's the, the strength of the leadership but Ford Foundation were one of the organizations that did actually step up to the plate and say, sure, we will lose a lot of the restrictions that we might historically. Um, so, so I'd like to explore that latest, why that is, you know, what is it that, that makes one able to do it and yet others still so reluctant to do so. Um, but I want to come to Chilande first. So uh, Chilande, you know, you also have a very rich experience of working across the board in development um, from, you know, institutional development, looking at something we look at, institutional voids um, in sub-Saharan Africa. You've also worked globally. Um, and in our conversation, you know, I, we could feel your frustration on this subject that obviously, you know, for years you have been uh, advocating for a change in the way aid and philanthropic capital is dispersed so that it does create more sustainability, more resilience. And you actually said to quote you, 
<laughs> I feel a little exhausted talking to the West. Um, so share with us your experience and, and, and perhaps in this first round of comments, you know, we're going to be looking more at the challenges, but I don't want everybody to get depressed. We will come to what the solutions might be as we move forward. But Shilandi, share with us your frustration and what is it that really frustrates you at the moment the most? Oh, that's loaded, and that's a whole one and a half hours conversation. Um, <laughs> but I want to zero in and, and just give you a little bit of some very practical, um, you know, a window into my life. Um, you know, in, in, in about, I, I think I'll bring it home with giving you a very specific case study. In, in about two, 2005, um, I met Effie. Um, Effie was working in a rural town in Kenya giving hope and bringing dignity and strength to women and children who had been adversely affected uh, by HIV in several villages in, in, in this town. And at that time, I was part of this new and energetic and passionate and very capable team um, that had just been fortunate enough to be part of one of the initial really huge um, multi-year bilateral uh, funding that was established to basically build what they were calling at the time capable partners, um, hoping to build them in a way that they would be able to receive funding, you know, the, this conversation we're having now. Um, and she was one of about 70 local national um, organizations and intermediary organizations that were identified as doing meaningful work that could contribute to this particular bilateral funders um, goals of how they want to contribute to, to, to the HIV and AIDS pandemic, eradicating the pandemic in, in, in the country. And we worked hard and we, you know, we, we were excited and um, we had three years to do this and we, we were all set. And in three years, we transformed these organizations uh, remarkably and significantly. We celebrated them, we documented them using, you know, fantastic tools like the most significant change technique um, to showcase the transformation that we have made, we have made um, onto this building these capable organizations, you know, ranging from, you know, establishing this checklist of what are the essential policies and procedures you need to put in place that will help guide you, you know, to, to practice and build cultures and interactions that were deemed necessary and, and, and right um, for, for, for solid organizations. Um, we helped build this very sophisticated financial management and m and &E systems mm -hmm. that could help to ease the anxieties that the funder had about those possible risks of how monies could flow out, but most importantly, help them capture the indicators that they wanted to capture um, in a way that fits their tools and their templates and their own sophisticated system. Um, we, we, you know, we did amazing things. We increased, the, the, you know, her staff. Effie uh, was one of three volunteers who were working. By the time we were done, she had 25 staff, 50 community volunteers. Um, you know, through coaching and fundraising, she raised her money, you know, 12 times where we found her. Um, other private philanthropists now coming in and we celebrated and said, look, look what we've done. You know, she now, she's grown and she's fantastic. She moved into bigger premises um, and, and, and with bigger premises, we, we gave money to buy stuff and, you know, made her set up this, uh, the famous asset register um, to make sure we document each and everything that we bought and not only document it, but brand it, right? Um, brand it so that everybody knows this is it um, and, and where it came from. And, you know, with very copious branding and marking um, guidelines that, that we all as, as local uh, capacity builders were taught uh, to make sure that we, we you know, we, we pass on that knowledge. Now, as we came to the final year of implementation and we were celebrating, um, 2007 post-election violence happened um, in, in, in Kenya. And this is a country that had enjoyed relative peace uh, for a very long time. And with this, of course, you know, the usual happened. Funders left uh, because we were now unstable. We are no longer the nice place to come and, and bring funding. Um, we, I was working within an INGO with international colleagues whom we worked alongside with. We learned a lot from them. But we also, you know, brought in our own expertise and knowledge. And, you know, as, as they left, we were left with the task of uh, closeout, right? So we are now closing out this grant that has done this amazing work. Um, and with closeout, what does that mean? Staff have to go, right? Some of them found some neat landing pads, some of them did not. You remember the risks that the asset register? We went back to it and made sure we can account for each and everything 
and take it back. We were taking back laptops, desks, chairs. I mean, we were taking back every single thing that we had branded um, and basically leaving these organizations as a shell. Um, and now they cannot pay this high rent. Never mind that we made them move away from the community land that had been given to them because you know there was perceived conflict of interest and therefore we couldn't fund um, anything within those lands. Um, I, I have lots of regrets and, and when I tell you I'm exhausted and, and, and it pains me and because I was left here with Effie who has 15 years on, Effie has not gone back to those glory days. Um, Effie is left here and I'm wondering, is there anything that we could have done to build more stability? What if we just build something in that land that she already had that we made her abandon? What if we had the kind of relationship where she would come and tell us, Shlandi, I know we said we were going to do this, but political climate, I need to anchor my communities in this way. Can I stop, you know, getting these numbers, pursuing these numbers and do this instead for my community? What about if I stop, you know, if, if we, instead of building those huge systems that right now are in the back burner, we allowed her to grow organically and did not force her to be a certain type of organization within three or five years uh, of working with her. What if the policies and procedures that we've established were anchored in her realities and not in the reality of what this funder thought um, would be a, a solid organization? Now, right now we are talking about flexible funding, but what that has done 15 years on, I am now interacting with my colleagues leading solid organizations but filled with anxieties because we have hammered into them that the money that they need is very limited you must compete with your fellow organization and to compete you must look this type of organization and so everybody's rushing to be something that maybe is not what is needed in the community um, that's what inflexibility does we want therefore then to fit into what that then looks like inflexibility means that as i lead my organization I don't want anybody else to know what I'm doing, lest they copy yeah, what I'm doing. And yet I, this is getting me money. Um, and so we have developed these project-based institutions that have become adept at creating visions to align with certain types of inflexible funding um, and, 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 and only narrowing in on a very niche member of the communities or, or group of communities within this wider community that they operate in that is interconnected but because there's only man funding for persons with disability or youth i only want to narrow down on them and not look at the whole ecosystem so how are we going to achieve sdgs as a sector if we are so our lens of day-to-day -day operation is, is 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 you know this one thing so for me flexible flexibility um funding is not just a sexy flavor or flavorful thing of the month it quite often is a matter of life and death and i get very impatient um, when people are still sounding like they need to put in their own definitions of what um you know of, of rules and regulations to in, in order for them to actually give um the funding to support the the, the work that they claim they want to do um, inflexibility means that um, you meet me where I'm at. It means you believe in my vision and our vision is aligned. And I found that most people are still afraid <laughs> to do that. So I will leave that opening remarks there just, you know, to, to let you know where I'm coming from. So when you hear other passionate appeals, that's, that's what wakes me up every morning. <laughs> Thank that. you, Chilandi. I think we, we, we understand much better now your frustration and, and yeah. Um, you raised so many issues as as Mukhtar did around you know who defines or who defines the these these tools these the way we measure impact etc who's defining them who's calling shots but also you know and again goes back to the aid conversation how we can avoid creating liabilities because if you you pump all this money in in a, in a, in a, in a restricted way and then pull out then you actually create liabilities for these organizations right and the argument is you would have done better off not to intervene at all. <laughs> Um, so I think that has an important uh, uh, potential overlap with the SDG. So a lot of conversations been had historically about who defined the SDGs and are we now still getting enough input into how they roll out or are they still a construct of the organizations who have the money? So lots more to pick up on there. Um, but you did start with talking about hope, which takes me nicely to Kennedy. So. Kennedy, of course, you've been um, inspiring uh, leadership in philanthropy in Africa for some time now, particularly with Shofko, uh, which obviously has the word hope in its name, which is already a good start. 
Um, but you've also been very involved as really a thought leader in the sector. You know, you've written extensively. You called out some of these structural issues um, for many, you know, international publications and written in international media. Where are you at at the moment? Because you did ask me when we spoke, you know, how hopeful I was. Where are you at at the moment in terms of, we know this is a big structural issue that's been going on for a long time. We were hoping that COVID would catalyze change. Has it? Are you hopeful? <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. And I think it's very beautiful just to hear from Mukta and Chilande. And, and I love when, when, when Mukta talk about uh, it's justice, not charity, you know what I mean? And uh, as you think about this development thing, uh, starting from the days of structural adjustments, and then what comes next is aid. Let's be honest with ourselves, you know? And I just love the idea that what is coming from the global south is going to the north. It's very interesting, you know? It's even if I, if I have an iPhone, I'm like, this is Congo. Yeah? <laughs> so I, I think we have to call these things out. That's the first thing to do. But uh, if you talk about this kind of restricted funding, uh, the idea is about clear is all about the colonial mentality. Believe me, the way the organizations from the global south are being treated compared to their fellows is north and south. It's really big gap, you know. So, 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 what, what is that? You know, we are the master. You have to do what you want. We know it because we are colonizers. Eh? They don't say that directly, but it really implies sometimes, you know. And uh, yeah, so as somebody who started a grassroots organization in the informal settlement in Kibera, I've seen it all. I've seen how it's been treated and how the measurement, where it's come from, you know what I mean? And how complex grant process, you know what I mean? And who, who set the book? By which book are we playing by? Are we, are we together? So is, first of all, is development really fair? No way, it's not fair, you know what I mean? And so, I have to go back to the hope, okay? So I think we're in a very exciting moment because we are allowed to talk about these issues. And then I can read my article that I wrote. I don't think I could, I could written that article five years ago, six years ago, never. You know what I mean? And there have been a lot of pieces of tokenism about supporting localization, you know? But with the Western standard, but as you say, but what gives me hope? What gives me hope? It's sad at the same time because of the calamities I've seen, the inequality that existed now, the gap is going on, and this COVID. I love Chilande talk about that when other organizations are going away. Chilande, it should be told to you now, when COVID hit Africa, for example, I'm sure in India and other other countries too, <laughs> they were packing their bags. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're all gone. You know, so communities who are left to solve their own problems, okay? But nobody thinks about local organization, honestly, you know what I mean? And, 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 and then a uh, clear, the idea of restricted funding is the power. Mm -hmm. I have power over you. You have to do A, B, C, D. And I am controlling you. That is called Restricted and restricted funding or flexible funding is like, I know I just have money, but I don't understand your ground, but I trust you, <laughs> okay? I don't know what you need because it's really, it's really, it's really make me so sad. I know Mokta knows this, whereby people are being asked to give this MND details, data, but at the same time, nobody wants to give you flexible funding. It is or capacity, to capacity to build the, the data. Yes. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. It's been, so it's really unfair. But they so you, you mentioned an important point there, though, Kennedy, that you think things are changing. And something we talked about in our COVID-19 report, that, that COVID did catalyze, to some extent, um, voice from the Global South. So we saw a lot of people. I mean, the whole discussion around philanthropy and decolonization you know, is, is really gaining traction now, like, yes. uh, like wouldn't have been heard of even, even two years ago. So do you think um, that is going to have enough momentum to drive system change? And, and what can we do to keep that, keep that voice, hold that space? I, I think we have to keep on, we, we have to really keep on calling this out. And uh, so right now, just give you a little bit of hope. 
the idea that administrator uh, Samantha Power, who I've been talking to uh, with his team, with our team, oh, she's, she's like, yes, we have to change this. I mean, so that never happened. I don't know what's going to happen. But right now, they are working on a strategy that I know they're going to unveil very soon. You know what I mean? So for me, that says something. That says something. Mm. And, and, and I like to talk about uh, organizations like foundations, like Ford Foundation. They have something called the, the build. You know that, the build, even before COVID. You know? So we have COVID and we have the Black Lives Matter, that movement. Yes. That has really accelerating this change. And I think my advice is that there is hope, but we have to hit this iron while it's still hot. Let's hit yeah. it. Yes, that's the message. So, and <laughs> I think, and I think that's that's you know partly why we have this seminar series. That's why the shift the power site is is gaining traction. And so, so Mukhtar, you know, let's come back to the Ford point then that, that Kennedy mentioned. So you work with Ford, and everybody's upheld them as kind of almost one of the few organizations that that literally dropped some of their conditionality. I mean, they were already doing. Um, some unrestricted funding before COVID, but but I mean I heard anecdotal evidence of them dropping conditions overnight and saying, "Look, guys, just go with what you need to do," which is kind of the holy grail of what what you know what Kennedy and and Jelani have been saying. Like, of course, local organizations on the ground they know what needs to be done better than somebody sitting in a headquarters that is not there. But so if Ford Foundation is willing and able to do that, do you think that others might follow in that? path now that there is, as Kennedy says, pressure from discussions around decolonization, from Black Lives Matter, you know, Global North organizations being forced to wake up and recognize that this is an issue. Do you think there is enough pressure to force others down that route? Or encourage? Maybe, uh, rather than force? Uh, yeah, I think uh, courage. Uh, I don't think we have the power. We don't certainly hold the power. We can critique, we can present models, we can present solutions. But I think there needs to be a fundamental acknowledgement within the DNA of global philanthropic uh, institutions and development agencies that the that issues are primarily issues related to injustice <clears throat> and unjust practices that must be uh, not just performed but must inhabit the structures of how investments are made within uh, uh, portfolios, within foundations, um, how uh, decisions are made about uh, resource allocation, who decides, is it a program officer sitting in their office in Washington, DC or New York? Um, I, I, I worry that, again, we've, we've seen this on and on, that uh, political movements are often co-opted by the powerful. And so I, for me, the issue of uh, unrestricted uh, funds should be the standard operating process within philanthropy. I can't believe that we're still having a conversation about unrestricted funds. We've been having these conversations for 50 years. So the question then tells, we know how to manage unrestricted funds. We know how to put systems in place that account uh, and, a tr and provide transparency and accountability and trust and legal and fiduciary uh, responsibilities to funds. We know how to do that. So what then I, I, is the issue for me at this point then, if we've solved the matter from an administrative matter, then there, it must be a political issue, an issue of power that is at the heart of uh, the beast. So to, to, you know, I would much rather, so I think, Great that the Ford Foundation and many other foundations provided unrestricted funding during that time. I think that is that should be the basis of yeah. an equitable relationship uh, with players. What I would like foundations of the caliber of the, the Ford Foundation to do is actually to really uh, have uh, um, uh, an, an alignment in their investment portfolios with their missions. If indeed that is the most fundamental issue, first thing that that foundation should should work on, a foundation can work on, and I was at a foundation doing this, working on issues, for instance, of child labor for 50 years in a country, but yet its investment portfolio might have 10 times 
wiped out all of the work that a program over, over decades was meant to repair. That is completely nuts. It makes absolutely no, no sense. And it, 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 is a, it is an insult to the intelligence of the communities, to the practitioners who are, who are dedicated to this field. So unless political change and an alignment of strategies and practices with the values and the issues of justice uh, that foundations claim uh, to want to uh, advance are, uh, are dealt with urgently, then all of the rest is just masquerade. So there are lots of practices that foundations can do. Um, mission alignment with investment is yeah. to be the first. Um, and then there are uh, issues about um, allocation of funds uh, to uh, third parties, to communities, so that decision make, making is happening at the grassroots and at the communities and within the societies. So, um, you know, having a strategy where decision making about resources uh, allocation can over time be passed on to communities is another uh, strategy. Um, making sure that communities uh, are represented at the governance level. For now, we, we know very well that um, Western philanthropies are self-perpetuating, not only are they self-perpetuating wealth, but they're also self-perpetuating governance and uh, access. So boards uh, assign uh, new board members, uh, they self-select each other. There needs to be accountability participation. So there are ways for us to change uh, things in a very pra practical manner. We have solutions, yet the question is at this point is, can the philanthropic sector and the leaders in that sector be honest enough with themselves and with their communities to create systems change and the political change internally to reflect the values that they aspire to? Because at the end of the day, you can market justice and equity and participation as much as you want, but if you don't uh, embody it in your mechanism and in your structures of power, then nobody's going to believe you. So that's why I keep saying this is a, a critical moment. Um, and we, we really pushed, pushed the envelope to, to the end. I think there's a lot of intelligence uh, at the grassroots level. There's also a lot of intelligence within our sector and if these changes of, of issues of reparation, inequity, justice, power, uh, transparency, accountability are not embodied in the philanthropic sector moving forward, we run the risk of really um, uh, a, uh, um, uh, alienating uh, uh, folks from our community and then becoming just uh, uh, an instrument of power uh, that, you know, like many of the other instruments of power that govern issues of inequity in our world. And that is certainly not what uh, yeah. many of us here have aspired to, nor want, want to. I, I still believe that these resources, there's a, there's a to, to end, the resources that uh, global North philanthrop uh, philanthropies have um, uh, uh, intellectually, um, emotionally, they think of these resources as private uh, resources but really they are not private resources. The terminologies that we use uh, where to designate a private foundation are misleading. These are, these are resources that were produced at the, by communities. And then, uh, and in, in many times in an extractive manner, um, in an, in an, in an uh, immoral manner, in an ethical manner. So we need to think about these resources as resources that are the community's resources and that are not, you know, um, governed in a private in a private manner. So there needs to be a kind of a, 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 a an intellectual, a visceral, political shift internally in our in the leaders who who run uh, philanthropic uh, resources, so that we can then do the work that is so urgent for us. I mean, we are we we have. We have solutions, we have incredible leadership, we have incredible communities mobilizing, but yet we're held back by these issues. So, and I hate, you know, for, for, for this conversation to be co-opted again, just, to, just to the way like political movements are co-opted all the time. 
you know, everybody put up signs here in the United States and elsewhere with of Black Lives Matter. But what are people doing on a daily basis to really hold accountable and change the structural nature of uh, injustice and inequity when it comes to issues of race, et cetera. So I think this is a moment where we have to really walk the talk. Otherwise, um, the most important thing, major solutions, urgent solutions, uh, and, uh, and solutions that are accessible to us will just not happen. More people will be left out of the picture and we will lose, we will be discredited as a sector that is viable and honest. So, so you make the point that, you know, you, you bring us very eloquently back to the point of, of solutions. You know, you started by saying that there needs to be recognition, that it needs to, that uh, Global North institutions need to recognize that aid and philanthropy has been historically massively imbalanced. They, they need to recognize that and that there is a moment here uh, and that philanthropy should not be an instrument of power. It should be um, obviously an instrument of of impact. And of course, some organizations like the Loudest Foundation have come out and put a report out that said unrestricted funding is just, it, you know, if you want impact, don't do unrestricted. So I guess there's a lot of um, evidence already that unrestricted and inflexible funding undermines the impact of philanthropy. And you've all talked about there being it being a moment. So what specifically do we need to do? So we have this shift the power website movement uh, uh, how can we make sure that we're not just talking to ourselves? So, so when you talk about, you know, recognition, Mukhtar, is there, and this is a question for all of you, really, you know, what specifically can the shift the power movement do in terms of advocacy to call for recognition? And ultimately, as you said, you know, that this is simply standard best practice and, and that we get to the point where if somebody is giving restricted funding, there's like shock and horror and their names and shame. So, what can this movement do? Chilande, what specifically would you like to see happening? So we get to that point where, where there is recognition of the, the inability of restricted funding to create impact. So much. Um, you know, I just, I just responded to somebody here who's saying that there's a lot of talk and no action uh, from, from somewhere. It, uh, I'm Marie and it, you know, it reminds me of my, my, what my father keeps saying, you know, a, a roaring lion um, kills no game, right? So, so talk, talk, talk is great, but then you actually need to take action to actually kill something. Um, and I think it, it, this is why I keep saying sometimes talking, you know, we've been talking for a very long time to Mukta's point, um, it's time to take action. And I, I can give you a few examples. Um, Shift the power movement is great. Um, at the micro level, they, I, there are numerous examples of organizations that are actually getting into some serious self-reflection it's easy to point on that that side and say what are they doing um, and my work in, in helping anchor organizations i keep saying what are you yourself doing to enable to, to to meet this process halfway as they shift funding can we do some work internally to rebuild our credibility and increase the impact that we are making so let's put in systems that are tailor-made to us that help us to anchor the communities first and foremost at the core of everything that we do and decision making so there's a lot of reflection and action happening there that organizations are, are coming together i have examples and more and more every day of organizations that are challenging themselves and saying let's actually decolonize our own minds um, and, and, and really interrogate our systems starting from the top so we have a significant number of boards here um, organizations that have dual boards they have us you know for example and, and and you know a board in east africa and it's been very interesting watching those shifts begin to happen even at the micro level and and, and when you talk about this shifting power power is not just about those big guys these you know western-based boards are powerful they they raise most of the money and we've got these local boards that are sitting back for a long time have been receiving mm. the money and yet they're saying we want to say right we want to make decisions but these guys are saying but we're raising the money right we are bringing in the money we don't we need to have a say so those conversations are beginning to have and a lot of organizations and local leaders are challenging themselves to have those bold conversations we are seeing people you know resigning because they, they can't mm. handle the conversation and I keep saying keep it moving you are on the right track some will fall off even founders can fall off but as long as the committees are there at the core you're doing it we are people like myself we're looking and, and Kennedy we are looking for allies 
in the north, people who, who speak the same language and coming together. I know Kennedy will speak a little bit about the revolution that he's trying to bring together um, around localization. I have joined forces with some colleagues in shared, an organization called Share Trust that were feeling the same kind of heat and reflecting for themselves in the West saying, what can we do here? Um, how can we leverage our privilege and do something that will help to shift the power? And so we are collaborating on a project, I'll put the link um, called the Local Coalition Accelerator, where we're trying to see what if we put together a local intermediary that is comprised of organizations, local organizations of different sizes, shapes, interests, serving different people. What if they all came together formed some kind of a peer accountability, but more importantly, got onto some joint action and their own governance um, and, and looked for the right funding to actually come and, and anchor their community. So the local coalition accelerator is showing us in practice what is going on. And my colleagues in the West, we are taking that, a lot of those lessons and information and saying to, to you know, we are trying to develop this multi-stakeholder platform where we bring bilaterals and, and, and different types of philanthropists and local actors and saying, guys, this is what we are seeing. Should we keep mm -hmm. moving? Should we pivot? What happens? Should we keep reinforcing? So there's an initiative like those that are on, on, on the ground. More and more collaboration and networking needs to happen. Um, we have, I have, you know, we have aligned ourselves with the East Africa Philanthropy Network, for example, to actually begin to challenge some of the conversations going on on the ground. When you talk about transparency um, in the philanthropy sector, I can go on and on on that. I have my own experience. For example, at the moment, we are trying to come up with a, a framework for accountability for the philanthropy sector in East Africa, and that's a fun, fun story experience in itself. Um, but we are trying to mirror what the CSOs have done and come up with their own civil society organizations. Um, they've come up with standards of excellence and, and dynamic accountability, they're calling it. Dynamic in the sense that we want to be accountable to all our different stakeholders, not just one. Um, so the philanthropy sector is playing catch up to CSOs now and saying, okay, they have demonstrated their goodwill. What can we do? And just talking to the philanthropists here and telling them, what, what is your understanding of accountability? Who are you accountable to beyond the government and your funder and, and your donors? It's, it's been an, honestly an uphill battle to, to, to get folks to engage in a meaningful and open way. Um, but we need to keep moving. And this network now, you know, we are challenging them and saying, you have this cohort of people, let's have those conversations. And I'm afraid, sadly, at least on this part of the, of the world, we are not having enough of those bold conversations. There's a conference coming up next week, um, as I do a plug for them. Um, yes, the please do. Philanthropy Network. Um, and, and, and where we're trying to start, you know, to accelerate those conversations and actually go in very bold spaces and actually start pointing fingers at ourselves, those of us who are practicing here, how are we practicing philanthropy? Sadly, I have not found, I have in, in my research, sometimes what is um, defined in the head offices in the, some of these organizations is not being practiced here. I, I, you know, recently just come from a space where we are receiving funding from this, uh, you know, major philanthropy uh, organization. And I was like, but I know in the US they have ABCD, but they are not, that's not how we are relating here, what's going on. Um, the two offices don't always speak as well as, as they should. And so I'm challenging more and more ourselves to actually find ourselves in spaces like this, where we can actually directly mm -hmm. speak to people who are making decisions and challenge and also just let them know what's actually going on on the ground so that they themselves can actually ensure that there's consistency in some of the practices that they are trying to promote. Um, I'll, I'll stop there for now. There's no, that's, that's really that's, uh, yeah. powerful stuff. Thank you, Chilande, for, for sharing. And I'm sure you know that does uh, bring hope for, for many working in the sector that people like you and your communities are now challenging and that perhaps that is one of the solutions, just consistent holding people to account, whereas perhaps historically that might have been a random conversation. Now, as Kennedy was saying, these, these conversations are becoming much more regular. Please do share a link to the uh, East Africa Philanthropy Network uh, conference. Uh, or we will also do that in the chat. Um, Jack will get on board. But I, interestingly, you talk about the, the issue of domestic um, resilience and domestic communities, and that came up a lot in our research. And Selina, who unfortunately hasn't been able to join us, who's in Indonesia, um, that's exactly what she was hoping to have spoken about, but not just a domestic um, sharing of resources and data and, and building networks, also an important point that we make in our report, but also funding. And she was talking about how Indonesia 
they have made a very, very, um, a, you know, a specific, uh, explicit effort to raise funds locally. And of course, that in and of itself significantly shifts the power dynamic. Kennedy, can I ask you, and, and after we've come to Kennedy, then I'm going to take the questions from the floor in case the audience is worrying that they won't get a chance to uh, have their questions answered. But Kennedy, what do you think, is, is it realistic to expect a much greater amount of funding to come from domestic resources as a means of offsetting the power imbalance? Yeah, I, I think that is really, if you think about the, the, the developing countries becoming middle income countries, you know, things will shift, you know. What has happened for a long time is the rich countries have been able to have a lot of resources. Yeah? And, and, and Claire, let's not lie to ourselves, uh, development is business, you know what I mean? So we also have to be careful when we want to point to local organization and be like, how can you be, you know, there's a big share out there, you know, that they deserve, you know what I mean? Folks <laughs> is looking at me. But I think it's a reality. We, we cannot see other uh, big organizations taking huge amounts of money and yet the locals are told like, be sustainable. I, I believe in sustainability, but uh, yeah, I believe in it, you know, but it's, it's, un, it's unfair. But the hope for me is that the local people are start asking tough questions, you know what I mean? And what really also gives me hope is this idea of uh, science is on our side, data is on our side. Claire, I talked about these numbers before, why never had about it? You know I mean, because who is sponsoring the research? Okay, so right now, I don't think what is happening now is everyone is being pushed in a wall, you know, and they have to now, they have to start thinking about and the, the issue, I know this they play the game. And I'm also scared of coming from colonization to new colonization. That's how they might happen in development. You know, there's been that kind of colonial mindset, you know, and as uh, Chelene talked about it, is that yes, we for you to be free, you have to decolonize your mind first. And that's what I'm seeing what most of the organizations from the South are doing. They are now asking tough questions, they are organizing themselves, they are talking about issues without 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 without, without fear. So honestly, I, I I I think that is possible, but let's also not uh, for let's also not forget that. Uh, there is enough resources in the foundations that their main objective is to work in the global south. Where is that money? <laughs> okay. But at the same time, I believe with you that yes, something is shifting, whereby we are getting our local philanthropies. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud to say that we have one of our black billionaire, Dangote. Yeah? You know, I see billionaires in East Africa. So this thing will start changing. You know what I mean? And don't take me wrong, Africans have been philanthropic, but in a different way. You help your village, you take their children to school. What, you now, what we are now doing is structuring development that fits African. Thank you. Yes, and, and you're right to, I mean, look at some of the definitions. So of course, philanthropy is, is, a, is a very um, heterogeneous concept. Uh, I mean, we're hearing a lot about community philanthropy now and the importance of community philanthropy, especially in the markets we work, Middle East, Africa, and Southeast Asia. And we're seeing a huge growth in that, in the whole philosophy, the spirit, um, which of course is very different from a global North high net worth philanthropist. So we do need to be careful that we don't overly generalize, but I think it's, it's great to hear from all of you that there, there is change happening. There is a, a more empowerment um, and, and more calling out of this uh, behavior and this power dynamic. So, so, so on the definitional piece, let's go to our questions. And we have one from Hannah, where she's asking uh, you, the speakers, to differentiate between adaptability and flexibility um, and how they relate to resilience, indeed, if there is a distinction to be made. So um, yeah, so perhaps one for you, Mukhtar, what do you, what do you think is resilience to you and, and how do adaptability and flexibility come into that? Um, look, I think that um, there are, um, aside from unconditional funding, um, there are a lot that partner uh, philanthropies and uh, 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 supporters of uh, development in the global south can uh, do, aside from just uh, giving uh, grants. Um, A, as I mentioned, um, alignment politically and ethically with 
the causes of uh, people in the global south. But there are also, um, and I mentioned outsourcing decision making, um, but I think encouraging pooled resources um, in the global south in the forms of community foundations, but also local investment funds. It's still like pulling teeth to try and get a foundation to kind of shift its practice from a grant making, a patriarchal patronizing grant making a practice. Foundations have a lot of intelligence, a lot of access, a lot of resources to put in place and provide access to alternative investment schemes in the South, um, lending uh, processes so that wealth can be accumulated uh, at the grassroots level and at the community level. Um, support for community uh, foundations is still minimal. That's something that needs to be uh, expanded or, as I mentioned, pooled resources. Um, um, you know, the, 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 uh, um, there's a lot of discretionary funds uh, within uh, foundations that gets evaporated. I think the notion of discretion, discretionary funds should be abolished. I think, uh, um, you know, if um, if we're being asked to uh, provide accountability for every uh, cent that we spend and also to provide governance structures and transparency structures that are absolutely insane to satisfy um, um, uh, Global North funders, they need to do exactly the same. I mean, I just don't understand why that's not a, a standard practice. So, um, you know, we, um, we need to increase expenditure by uh, Global North foundations. So far, a very small amount of expenditure out of their investment portfolios happens on a yearly basis. Everybody usually aligns themselves to the, to the bare minimum of what's allowed uh, legally. Well, I mean, the world cannot function on the bare minimum and uh, there needs to be added expenditure. Um, but you know, allow creative. There's a there's a lot of uh, public, private, civil society, uh, private um, uh, creativity that is developing right now um, to think about issues of resources at the local level. And foundations need to move into that new realm so that they can advance new uh, investment practices, um, look at new technologies and make sure that the bottom line for them is not whether you know three workshops were you know uh, accomplished by a local organization mm -hmm. but rather ha is there an accumulation of leadership at the grassroots level do they have self determination in terms of their financial resources is there wealth accumulation at the community level and those are things that we can actually do we just need to have the systems in place and we need a new knowledge to emerge uh, and expertise to be housed within foundations in order to begin to roll out uh, a hybrid uh, set of, uh, uh, of resources and support uh, schemes uh, to really enable an accumulation of, of, uh, of uh, resources at the grassroots level. And so that those resources can then be uh, uh, generated locally and amplified uh, locally. It's still pull, like pulling teeth um, when an organization tries to uh, save a few bucks and put them in a reserve fund so that uh, when uh, mm -hmm. pr pr trouble, uh, trouble arises, they can uh, have a bit more resilience. It's like unbelievable. It's the, you know, I mean, I mean, what are we talking about? Most of us are functioning under surreal environmental conditions, political conditions, social conditions, but yet, if we have a hundred thousand dollar grant, we're unable to put two or three thousand dollars of that yeah. into a resilience fund. So th there's just it's just there's so many things that can be done. Um, you know, supporting giving circles um, in, at the at in the in the global south, but also creating giving circles that are that are that are both um, north south uh, 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 a mix of of of, of talents and 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 uh, and trades in order to also uh, create uh, resources um, at the local level. Um, yeah, those are some some ideas that for me um, can significantly help issues of uh, resilience uh, in the global south, which to me are really about self-determination, 
um, financial self-determination, uh, uh, strategic self-determination fundamentally. Thanks, Mokhtar. So that's, that was Sahana's point on, on adaptability and flexibility. And I think you very richly point out that the, the sheer range of issues that can be done, that solutions are available, that can, uh, can embody that ad adaptability and flexibility so that you get resilience. Um, so we have a question from Pablo from the uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires, who is asking about how we can get involved in political and economic power change without losing our autonomy as civil society organizations. Who's up for that, Kennedy or Chilande? Chilande, go for it. Kennedy, did you want to go for it? I can try. Go ahead, Chilande. <laughs> I, have, I have other questions for Kennedy, okay, don't worry. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I'll give you three, three key things. Um, I'll keep it simple. Um, you know, it, as, as we get lost in all these huge, you know, change efforts, I think, where we get our confidence um, and, and stay our course is in three key things. Uh, one, of course, is where does your vision come from? If your vision comes from the right place, you will agitate for the right things. Um, and if it's anchored in the community, you can never go wrong because that's, that's what will keep you driving and keep you adapting and keep you resilient. Uh, two is what are your values? Have you clearly defined them? And are you set up, aligned yourself across all the values? So even as you get into the whole, you know, the shifting game in the power game as long as you're anchored in those um you're good um and the third piece i will I, I will share with you something that my husband keeps hammering to me every time he's an economist and a practicing m e and learning um specialist um he keeps going back to you must always ask yourself some fundamental questions um are you doing the right thing right and and and, and how how will you know that you're doing the right thing uh, number two, are you doing it right, which brings your context in, into play. So is it right to all your whole ecosystem, um, the channels that you're using, the platforms you're using, your strategies, are you doing it right? And the third and most fundamental thing is, are you making a difference, therefore, you know, having put all those things together? So if you keep those, those, those three things in line, wherever, whatever space you go into, if you know, if you're, you're having a conversation or trying to address political issues or economic uh, shifts or structural shifts, those should be able to anchor you as civil society organizations and of course align to the, with the right people. Thank you, Chilande. That was great, very practical. And, and I do like your, um, your point, your husband's point around, uh, I think, um, you know, often we get caught up in the log frame and complex KPIs and we forget the most important question is, are you doing the right thing? And are you doing it right? Uh, and that's you know probably more powerful than any KPI spreadsheet that you could have. But um, it is often easy to get caught up in technical issues. Um, let's move to the question from Rojan, which is asking about uh, some speakers refer to the ways in which accountability has been organized with unrestricted funding. Could you point to me to some of the evidence and resources of how this was done? So I think what Rojan is asking here is uh yeah ways in which um unrestricted funding can still achieve accountability i guess some of the pseudo justification as to why organizations can't give unrestricted funding is because they say yeah but then we don't know where the money would go how it would be spent which is a pretty poor excuse but talk to us about that then maybe kennedy do you want to take that and how how yeah. we yeah <clears throat> Okay, good. That's a, that's a really good question that many funders ask, but it's also this, it's also a simple, that's a simple answer. You know what I mean, I, I believe that there is a partnership between a funder and the organization. They are all partners, and they should not lie. There is nobody who just take money and doesn't really report back. And at Shofco or other organization, I'm not doing now has been a learning whereby we have known that everything ought to be perfect. You have to accept that. You have to come back again on the learning. That's what about, that's about power. You know what I mean? We are all equal, okay? So I, the money that I got, we really had a lot of success that can be shared with other people. These are our challenges of the journey, you know what I mean? So you don't just take money. For a good example here is from McKinsey. Oh my, this amazing woman who is giving a lot of money out there. You know what I mean? And, uh, she doesn't want to care about it, but there is partnership. Whether you can come back and share 
what is happening you know what i mean as a, as a learning you know what i mean so so i think see it more like uh is more like a learning thing you know whereby you can also sh- sh- share back what has happened you know you are not just taking money and spending it you know another thing that i love that sorry for sorry clear that mukta talked about is do you know clear if any most of the foundation find you that you have a resilient fund you are out it's so mm. sad you know what i mean so and yet during this kind of hard time that kind of like this covid or when organization is going through hard time what do you do you is like you're feeding from hand to mouth it's very tough so and that's what i just want to bring that out that it's very very important for organization to start changing their way of thinking thank you yeah absolutely and and as i think mukta mentioned in the beginning you know if you come at it as you say from a partnership rather than as giver donor and recipient then immediately even the lexicon changes the power dynamic and indeed shout out to mckinsey scott who um who is indeed giving the vast majority of her billions of investment in in unrestricted format and hopefully um setting the course for others to follow uh so another question from andrew here good one here from andrew wigley who's asking do we see any evidence of behavior change by next gen philanthropists so great question because we see of course a lot of growth in philanthropy in our markets middle east africa southeast asia from the next generation are they doing things differently mukhtar i'll give that one to you since you probably uh, got some of that international perspective there so what's happening particularly next gen not not necessarily from emerging markets but also from the global north no oh, absolutely that is a fund i think that's where most of the exciting um uh, uh thinking and and positioning is happening um i think um um it's not an area that i know much about but i've been poking my nose into meetings uh um in the last few years with emerging uh philanthropists who are inheriting uh, uh large amounts of wealth health and this wealth is only increasing guys it's not you know stagnant in any, in any way there's more and more and more of it mm-hmm. uh, but what we're seeing is and what i've noticed is that um younger philanthropists who are inheriting wealth from their parents tend to be um more uh left leaning more liberal uh, more focused on it, more aware of uh, power um and the power that they have and so they're uh much more thoughtful about uh, making decisions um doing no harm in uh their uh, philanthropic practices um and so i think that there's there's an opportunity there to to really engage with uh with the younger generation uh, of folks um uh, out there um I, um the um in the global south but again this is pro- purely anecdotal for now Uh, i think emerging philanthropists or younger philanthropists tend to still be uh, very hands on and want to uh, fund uh, things that they uh, that they closely manage or to operate uh, uh, programs rather than to uh, build trust uh, trusting relationships there are a variety of uh, w- reasons for that in my mind but um, in general um, in the north um emerging philanthropists or uh philanthropists who have inherited inheriting wealth are much more aware of the complications and the delicate uh dynamics of their power um and they, we're seeing more and more uh forums for their education to nurture them in the right direction and to present them with alternatives to a kind of a a, a patriarchal top down mm. uh, uh process of giving Absolutely and it's something we're also seeing at, at both at our center and more broadly at the university that um indeed working with family offices where the next generation are much more entrepreneurial much more innovative and in the main they're less likely to want to set up a classical foundation and much more willing to look at enterprise and and investing uh so so that's great um we have a question from uh Louis Klein which is probably going to be our last question from the floor because I do want to give the panelists time to we have almost run out of time on the um it flies so fast when we have such rich discussion um but so final question from the floor and then I'm going to ask our speakers um to respond to the question and Gladys has managed to throw in a, qu- a question as well so okay two questions from the floor and then back to you guys uh to just give you closing remarks and particularly to focus on again the solutions part so we we do have this platform now we have this opportunity there's a growth in this movement so what specifically uh can we call on our audience to to uh, to do but before we go there let's talk to louis question so the ancient greek root of philanthropy is love for humanity indeed 
Um, do we have to ask today, what's love got to do with it? And how do we grow a shared understanding of humanity, transcending the distinctions of North and South, East and West? Indeed, so sorry, um, Louis, I slightly uh, restructured your question there, but essentially, indeed, you know, philanthropos, I think is the original. So, so love of humanity, how, have, we, have we completely lost the connection with that original philosophy? Or can we absolutely use that kind of thinking to build broader communities? I'm gonna just jump to Gladys's question and just leave that one there for you because it is more of a philosophical one perhaps than a specific uh, technical question. Um, and of course, both are welcome. And Gladys is asking, how can CSOs from the global South demystify and inform development so that we avoid repeating the same mistakes that we have in the past? That's also a great question. I mean, it's something we talk about a lot at the center about how good we are in the philanthropic sector of reinventing the wheel and duplicating. So two points for you to think about, uh, my speakers, as you close out. One, this whole philosophy of philanthropy. Ha have we lost that spirit of love of humans? And, and two, how indeed do we make sure that we learn from the past and don't reinvent the wheel? So I'm going to go ladies first. Chelande, do you want to just give us your closing thoughts on uh, A, the discussion we've had today, those particular questions, interventions, and what you'd like to see uh, as an outcome of today's event, our broader series, and all the work that's happening under the rubric of Shift the Power? Sure. Um, I don't think we've lost our humanity. I think that the, 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 the whole premise of this conversation is, is because of that. I think in any language, in any corner that you go into, you talk about down south, you hear of the concept of Ubuntu, it's, you know, humanity. You come to East Africa and you hear Ujama, you know, togetherness and, and humanity. And, you know, specifically Kenya, we borrowed from India, Harambe of coming together. Um, it's not there. We, we got lost in, you know, in the whole historical relationships of, you know, power imbalances. We forgot as we scrambled for what was told to us was limited. Um, but I think we are coming back because it's still at our core. And I think, you know, having said that, I'd like to see a lot more of that continue to happen. Um, we will only get to where we need to get to by continuing to have this dialogue. Somebody wise, one of my wise mentors recently told me, you want to see change, keep you know, communicating, effective communication is repetition. We must repeat the story, we must repeat the message, keep it going until it becomes the norm. You know, um, there are people are talking about business unusual, but perhaps we just go back to what was usual. What we're doing now is what is unusual, to be honest. Um, and so more connections, more support, um, more influencing is, is what I would call for as we go ahead. Um, flag, you know, the, the restricted funding has, um, you know, we, we say here that, um, you know, um, you know a, a leopard might be rained on and, and sit cowering somewhere, but, you know, the rain does not wash away the spots. And, and lots of leaders were rained on with all those terms and conditions that were put on, on them. It doesn't mean that the leopard in them died. That's still there. Um, and I see the sun coming up, things are drying up, and I, I hope to see more leopards wandering about confidently doing what they need to do in their ecosystem. That's how I would live it. Thank you so much, Shilandi, and, and you are, you know, very inspiring to listen to, and we look forward to continuing to engage with you and your community as this whole conversation moves forward. Um, Kennedy, uh, over to you next. Give us your thoughts on the whole, the whole idea of our humanity, uh, learning from the past, and the way you'd like to see the Shift of Power movement go. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the only challenge we're facing is this idea of, yes, part of those love. But as Buka talked about before, is that there's uh, people are hiding behind that love. We are asking them, be yourself. Let's be honest. Let's speak the truth. Do you, wanna, do you really want to bring transformation? We are here to support you. Otherwise, we'll be pretending. So yeah, there's that humanity going on there. And that's why we are here today, that things can change. And uh, what also kind of give me hope is the idea that uh, People are not sleeping. We are, everyone is doing something. And right now, everyone, wherever they are, if they can do small, small things, that's how change happens. Yeah, so I believe that let's keep on pushing for this agenda and truly it will have an impact. I know that there's a lot of challenges because this, this talk has been talked before, but to be told, never been the way it is today. There's a big difference comparing now and few years ago. So I hope we have to put our leaders accountable. 
for this to happen. One example, I want to see the next SDGs <laughs> that people don't sit in a Western <laughs> office. We want to hear communities' voices becoming part of a global change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kennedy. And, and you know, as, as such an inspiring practitioner yourself, I think that's great advice. You know, it's it's slow but steady, but there is momentum, and we should indeed uh, seize the opportunity to keep that momentum going for for change. Um, it's great again to have you with us. I know we will continue to work together on some of our research with Capsi and Clearview uh, and Vodafone. So, cool. Shout out to them on the work they're doing on philanthropy in Africa. And over to you, uh, Mukhtar, last but by no means least, so your thoughts on the humanity of philanthropy, learning from our mistakes and, and your broader hopes for this movement and these kinds of discussions. How do we make sure that indeed we do um, walk the talk and, and that this translates into action and advocacy and change? Yeah, I, uh, I agree with uh, Kennedy, you know, I think we are seeing a building of momentum and discourse and a sense of awareness, you know, so, so the conversations that have uh, percolated to the surface uh, over the last few years would have been impossible, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a decade ago. Uh, um, um, and, uh, and I think, you know, the global political movements uh, and the conditions that we are all facing um, are, um, are forcing us to ask those very fundamental and honest uh, questions and to have these conversations, um, not uh, as a form of just, you know, moaning and uh, critiquing, but because urgent solutions are available and we are really uh, uh, living on borrowed time. We spoke a lot about uh, this divide between North and South. I know that I painted a picture also of this kind of, uh, of duality and this kind of uh, bifurcation, but clearly our world is interconnected in, in, in ways uh, that uh, it's never been uh, before. Um, whether we look at the global uh, 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 environmental crisis, um, the largest movement of refugees and uh, people who are in exile on the planet, um, um, we clearly see uh, uh, a, a strengthening of ties between um, uh, people working on indigenous rights and feminist movements and issues of racism. Um, it, today, it's impossible to, uh, to really support Black Lives Matter, for instance, without also supporting uh, the rights and, 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 and issues of equity for Palestinians. So there is an intersectional uh, nature of the world we're living in. We are all global citizens and the issues are increasingly interconnected. And so I really feel that solutions um, are, are, and the breadth of uh, intelligence and experience from throughout the globe is, needs to be harnessed in the coming uh, decade to really put in place a, 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 an alternative uh, to the current conditions. It's, it, you know, it does feel like um, also with this, with the pandemic that, you know, our kind of global um, governance systems, but are also our institutional structures are outdated to respond mm -hmm. to the current uh, uh, to the current crisis, and so it feels like you know our, we are going through a kind of a birth, and we don't know yet what we're going to birth, but you know we have a we have a, a sense of what we'd like to create, and I and I and I and I do believe that I'm hopeful that um, we have a strong chance. Um, as long as we are uh, committed and honest uh, about uh, the political di dy uh, dynamics and realities that, um, that impact decision making and the allocation of resources. Um, and I also do think that, um, you know, we often talk about a, a democratic capital that is missing in the global south, but I actually worry more about the democratic capital that is missing in the global north, um, because um, if those, if you know, if questions of of power and access and resources are not uh, 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 acknowledged and dealt with um, in uh, all of our democracies, no matter where they might be, then we run the risk of, 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 of failing this next phase of uh, creative uh, restructuring of power dynamics and creating the institutions that embody the, the world that we want to live in.
and that we that is uh, that is interconnected and going to be more interconnected as we go forward. So I'm hopeful that um, there is a sense of uh, shared humanity and shared purpose that is emerging, especially with young people. And I hope that as a sector, what we can do um, is actually design. Uh, a, a political strategy of change. I know for uh, for for many of us who have been in this in this sector for years, you know, getting politically organized or lobbying or um, being uh, overtly open about issues of uh, justice um, that was a taboo or something frightening. But I think clearly we cannot move to the next stage. We cannot create the world that we want, nor the institutions and the systems that support. Um, creativity and resilience moving forward without um, without this work uh, that is you know could be might be difficult but there's no way uh, moving forward without it. Brilliant! Thank you, Mukhtar. Thank you for 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 getting us to to think about these things more deeply. Thank you to all three of you for being truly inspiring. Uh, clearly, we have some very significant structural challenges. We are living very difficult times, but listening to the three of you speak and knowing the work you're all doing collectively and knowing that there are many others working with you and in our community doing a similar work is, is really assuring, uh, reassuring and, and, and inspiring. And certainly, you know, just to emphasize that our role here at the center is indeed to encourage these conversations. We are here to support you all in whatever way we can. The center is dedicated to philanthropy in the global south, specifically Middle East, Africa, and Southeast Asia. I, uh, two of our recommendations from our first piece of research, our COVID-19 research, um, one was give unrestricted funding. <laughs> Guys, let's just get with the program. And two was networks. And I think this, this is an example of the kind of networks that we hope to be able to facilitate. We are, of course, an organization sitting in the global north, but we believe that this powerful brand we have can be used for amazing good uh, and for convening these conversations that historically weren't so common. And now this is a regular series that we have bringing um, Global South practitioners in partnership with their counterparts in the Global North to talk about how we can improve uh, and become more strategic with our philanthropy. So a really important conversation. We thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, just a shout out to any of you interested in the work of the center, please follow us on social media, look at our website. We have our next executive education program where we'll be talking about a lot of these issues coming up in October. And of course, the next session of the Shift the Power series will be coming up um, in, where are we now? So also October. My colleague Jack will be sharing uh, dates and details of that. But we would like to see this as our contribution to the movement. So please do get in touch with us. If you want to, any of you speak, get connected to our speakers, let us know. Uh, we really want to create a community around this subject and, and around this change movement. So again, a huge thank you to all of you for being with us. Uh, thank you to our audience for some of the inspiring chat as well. This video will be online shortly on our YouTube channel. So if you have colleagues or friends who missed it, please do share wildly, wildly, wildly even. Uh, and if you have uh, ideas of specific topics under the Shift the Power uh, rubric that you'd like us to address or speakers, then please come forward. You know, we're here to support this community uh, uh, and we're delighted and honored to have had um, our three speakers with us here today, but we want to do more of these. So please do stay in touch. Huge thank you again to all of you for joining us and see you next month. Bye-bye.